Philemon. Paul, Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. To Aphia, our sister. To Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my, for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become both useful to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very, my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favour to you will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you from a for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, talking about people's heads turning when they see the difference in a Christian. We can say of baptism that when someone is baptised, it is an outward testimony of an inner change. The change has already taken place. And yet many people look at Christianity and look at Christians and would think that, well, really, you saying you're a Christian is just some decision you've made and that they see no difference. And they, in a sense, expect there to be no difference because that's just religion that you have got. There was an elector who was the elector, in other words, the governor, the ruler of Brandenburg. And this particular man, whose name was John Sigismund, he converted, converted to a particular form of Christianity. And the person writing about him gives the title of the name of that particular form of Christianity that he converted to as Calvinism. But the writer went on to say how 
he was a very heavy drinker and that his life increasingly after his conversion was one that was out of control. He became more and more obese. He became more and more lethargic and he was unable to govern. But the way in which this account was written was that the fact that he was converted to a particular form of Christianity was a so what. The writer in his days of research probably hadn't expected to see any dramatic change over this person. Probably expected him to, well, that's he's taken up this particular form of religion. Well, so what? There's this man. And tragically, it was a so what. There was no difference in him. When a person has mere religion, there's no power to change them. They might adopt a new lifestyle, but it doesn't make a difference to the inner heart of the person. And so there's someone whom, well, they've been in the habit of being untrustworthy, always letting you down. And they say they turned over a new leaf or turned over a new page, as it were, that they're different now. Can you trust them to be different? Do you expect them to be any different? When I worked for one particular firm, one of the longest jobs I had in those days, indeed it was the longest job, I was there for three years, which was incredible really, considering the life I was leading, they would have, they would give you each year, come April, two weeks, no, I was going to say holiday, two weeks uh, leave for sickness. So if you were sick, you could be absent for two weeks and all you had to do was ring in and say, I'm sorry, I've got this or that wrong with me. Um, and it was there for you. They would pay you full pay. After that, you needed a doctor's certificate. Each year, I would use up my sick leave within the first two months. Every year of the three years that I was there. That's the kind of person I was. If I'd suddenly come in uh, one May the 1st, as it were, when it's the way, the 6th or whenever the, the new year comes around, as it were, for these things and said, I won't be off sick this time anymore, unless it really is a sickness. No one would have believed me. No one would have believed me. But here in this account that we've just read, we have perhaps one of the greatest references that can be given to have an apostle give you a reference that though you were once useless, you're now useful. Well, can there be any higher commendation, humanly speaking, than that? To have an apostle give you such a reference. But then also to go on and to say, look, this is how confident I am about this man. I tell you what, if he owes you anything, charge it to me. Charge it to me. He gives him an IOU. That's how high he Paul thinks of Onesimus. And the Lord, what we see here, is how the Lord makes someone who was indeed useless, useful. That's what happens. The question for us then, that that raises immediately, is to say, well, do others think so highly of us? Were the Apostle Paul around today? And we to perhaps be sent on a mission by him or to be sent somewhere whatever it might be could we expect we're going for a job and we need a reference could we expect the apostle paul to give us such a reference do others think so highly of us but that's not the reason for looking at philemon this morning and whilst of course in this passage if you follow it paul urges forgiveness and that's the great theme of this account there's a great lesson there on forgiveness. That is not our emphasis this morning. What I'm looking to do is to come at this account to reinforce our understanding of submission. So if you think back to when we were last in Ephesians and Ephesians chapter 5, we read that we were always to give thanks to God the Father for everything 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is where we were last time in Ephesians. And so I want to reinforce this idea of submission. You see, what Paul is looking for here in Philemon, in the person of Philemon, is in a sense the practical outworking of those words, of that doctrine, of that teaching, of that request to the church at Ephesus. Submit to one another. It's the practical outworking of it. He's asking Philemon to submit in the situation that we have before us this morning. When it's something small, something minuscule, as it were, that doesn't matter, it's easy. So in conversation, in a, in a friendly atmosphere, in a light-hearted conversation, maybe even in some kind of discussion, it's easy to, when two people speak at once, say, oh, no, no, after you, after you, or at the door to be courteous, so that can get you into trouble today, I know, but to be courteous and let the other person go before you. In small things, it's easy. But when it comes to something significant, it's a different matter, isn't it? Well, it can be. The challenge is harder. And that's where we see here the practical outworking of this. It's a good example to look at because it's something that's far harder. It's not just like someone who's been given the name bishop or priest and it's Easter time. So there he is at Easter time and he's uh, got some kind of towel and, and he's kneeling down like this and he's got one or two chosen people who he knows are going to be, you know, worthy of it as it were and he's washing their feet because it's some kind of thing that's done in certain um, so-called church circles it's not like that such a, a so-called bishop or so-called priest can do that kind of thing oh isn't he humble but actually if you get to know him he's a, he's a terrible person he'd never back down on anything this is different you see here Onesimus, whatever we may think of slavery today, Onesimus is Philemon's legal property. He belongs to him. And he's left. He's master. He's left, presumably, secretly. And worse, there's every probability He's stolen from him as well. And so really, given that he is legally Philemon's property, Philemon has every right, in a sense, as the owner of this slave, to punish him. And there's a sense in which in the society that he's living, especially if he has other slaves, you need to set an example. If you show yourself to be a weak master, that might well, may well come back on you in a wrong way. And so there's every reason to argue that actually, if Onesimus comes back, he should get it. He should be in big trouble. Yet Paul is calling for him to lay aside any personal hurt, any wrong that's been done, and accept Onesimus back in one sense. No longer as a slave, but certainly, spiritually speaking, as an equal. It may be that he comes back to serve, as indeed all Christians are to serve. But Philemon, you should accept him back as your spiritual equal, for we are all equal. We are all one. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters together. And there's nothing that this Apostle Paul can legally do about this. He can't force him by the hand of law to obey. But of course, as an Apostle, he could use his Apostleship to demand as an Apostle, I command you as an Apostle of Christ to do what I believe to be the right thing in this. And to forgive and to forget. But he doesn't want to do that. 
He doesn't want to use his apostleship. He wants to see Philemon be of his own volition, of his own free will in the matter, as it were, willing to do more than what Paul is actually asking. Now that, for Philemon, as indeed for anyone in that situation, would call for, and indeed does call for, humble submission to Paul's request. And truly, truly, we can only humbly submit in the right way through grace. Only through grace is that truly done. And that takes us again back to the verses we were looking at before in Ephesians, where we're not to get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but to be filled with the Spirit. In order to submit to one another from the heart, in order for Philemon to submit and do above what Paul is asking and not feel that he's been coerced into it by Paul's sort of, you know, uh, double meaning, as it were, and innuendo that is you know, suggestive language and such things. No, no, it's that Philemon, filled with the Holy Spirit, is willing to do above what Paul asks. And whether a situation you may face is more extreme, harder than the situation that Philemon faces with Onesimus, whether it's lesser, we too face that same challenge. Where my own heart and mind wants to say no, wants to put me forward, wants my will to be done. What I've got to do is to follow the example that is set before us in Philemon this morning and to be submissive. So let's consider, first of all, the, the background to uh, this letter. Philemon himself has clearly been converted because in verse 5 we uh, read that Paul has heard about his faith in the Lord Jesus and his love for all the saints. He goes on to pray uh, that he may be active in sharing his faith so that he will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Sharing there, I think Paul is talking not just about witnessing, it's not so much about witnessing to the unsaved, but about sharing the good things that you have, the blessings that you've been blessed with. Bless others. And your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. In a sense here, he's setting up um, Philemon's mind for what is to come, what he's going to talk about, reminding him and, uh, and saying how overjoyed he is to hear that this is a man who has experienced an inner change and who is demonstrating to others the love that is within him through the love of Christ that is within him by practically and in other ways helping the brethren, the brothers and sisters around him. Question again for us, do we display such evidence? Do we display that kind of evidence of conversion? Do we show love? Do we show consideration and care for others? Are we supporting one another as we should? To go on with this conversion, it would seem, if you look at verse 19 of Philemon, it would seem that Paul himself was the instrument that the Lord used. used. People say, don't they, um, such and such person led me to Christ. The person was an instrument. They were the one who shared the gospel to that person. That person went away and that person realised that this is all true and that person came to the Lord in repentance and faith. And they were saved. And they say, ah, oh, that dear brother or that dear sister, they were the one, that person was the one who led me to Christ. And here, verse 19 seems to, su seems to suggest that that was Paul's privilege, that Paul was the vessel used by the Lord. He says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, whatever it is that is owed, not to mention that you owe me your very self. That seems to suggest that Paul quite possibly when Paul was at Ephesus and preaching there that Philemon was converted under his ministry.
But then, where is Philemon now? Well, Philemon now, I think we can be pretty confident, is at Colossae. Because this links in with one or two things that are said in Colossians. If you turn to Colossians chapter 4, we read in chapter 4 and verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother. This is Paul writing to the church there, of course, at uh, Colossae. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. It's where he's come from. Now I'm sending him back. They will tell you everything that is happening here. And then, of course, in verse 17, uh, we have tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Now, if you flip back to Philemon, Archippus is one of the ones that Paul greets in the letter. It's sent to Philemon, but he says um, to Philemon, and then he says also to Aphia and to Aphia and to Archippus. And so scholarly people, theologians, others, those who try to uh, work out the links with different epistles and when this was written and when that was written. The suggestion is, and it seems to be um, most likely, is that this letter was a personal letter written to Philemon by Paul when Paul sent the letter to the Colossians and that um, Tychicus was the one to bring that, as it were. And Tychicus was uh, the man who went together with Onesimus, and Onesimus being sent back from whence he's come to Philemon. To consider a bit more on Philemon, it's highly likely he was quite wealthy, has at least one slave, well that wasn't uncommon, uh, but the church, you look at verse 2 of Philemon, and uh, the church that meets in your home, it's a greeting to the church there. A greeting to the church that meets in his home. So it must have a reasonably, reasonably sized home to meet in, in order for you know, all the members to gather, as it were. So he's probably quite a, a wealthy person. Not only that, though this letter is a, a personal letter to Philemon, it's clear Paul wants it read to these, or, or um, um, read to, or the, these two people to see it, because he names them there in verse 2. But he also says, um, the church that meets in your home, so greet them as well. In other words, this is something that, yes, it's for you privately, uh, Philemon, but also proclaim it to the church. Now, why do that? Well, it gives an opportunity for Philemon to show his uh, humbleness and his submissiveness, but also, and in a sense, reading it to the church means that the whole church will be able to marvel at the Lord's work in Onesimus' life of conversion, because that's what we come to now in our consideration as a background, that Paul, it would seem, is a prisoner and therefore he's in Rome. It's probably somewhere around about 60 or 62 AD that this letter is being written. And Paul, as we read in verse 9, is a prisoner. Then somehow, don't know how, but this man Onesimus comes to him. You can raise all sorts of conjecture, all sorts of ideas as to how he comes to him. Does he come to him direct? Does Epaphras, who's involved here, um, find him, meet him uh, somewhere in Rome and bring him to Paul? Don't know. But the suggestion is that Onesimus, although it doesn't say directly that he's stolen from Philemon, most commentators would say that seems to be what's taken place here. Now, why has he done that? For whatever reason, Onesimus has wanted to flee, has wanted to get away, has wanted to leave his life of slavery. And to get to Rome from Colossae would mean some kind of journey on a ship, wouldn't it? You need to pay your passage. 
So has he stolen in order to get the passage to Rome? Why does he want to go to Rome? Worst scenario, he's gone to Rome because he just wants to live a free man's life. And Rome is a big place where lots of slaves have fled. And though the life there isn't necessarily going to be actually any better for them, they think, like many people think, go to London, bright light, big city. Is everything's there for them? Is that in his thinking? Or is it actually that he really desperately wants to get to Rome to see Paul? It's more likely the former, but I don't know. But whatever, he gets to see Paul. He's brought to Paul. And is he coming to Paul because he's appealing for shelter? You see, at that time, there had been a law that was passed. It was an Athenian law that was operated by the Romans that... If there was a slave who felt that his life was some way in danger, he could flee from his master and go to a third party, someone else of a, a wealthy uh, a, a, a position in society and appeal for shelter. This person then would act as a mediator. And what this person would do would be to go to the other man's the slave's master and try to bring about some kind of reconciliation. If that wasn't possible, and or the slave was refusing to go back there, then what this, in effect, new master would do would be to sell the slave on again. And the money that was raised from the sale of that slave would go to the former master to pay him for his loss. Was Onesimus seeking to kind of bring about some kind of um, appeal to Paul to bring about his release. More likely, if there was anything of that in it, in wanting to look after him, if you turn to Deuteronomy and chapter 23, what you see there is what Paul would have been more familiar, well, he would have been familiar with Athenian law as well, but what have sat, would have sat better with Paul would be this in verse 15. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand him over to his master. Let him live among you wherever he likes and in whatever town he chooses. Do not oppress him. No Israelite man or woman is to be, well, that's going on, has become a shrine prostitute and so on, but he's to be allowed to live among you. Do not oppress him. So Paul would have been much more familiar and wanting to follow that Old Testament law. But of course, at the same time, legally, he can't do that. Because legally, Onesimus is Philemon's property. And what takes place, if you look at verse 10, he says in Philemon, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. Paul uses that language each time. He uses it of Timothy, doesn't he? He uses it of others. He uses it in terms of those whom, in a sense, I, I was going to say his birth, but the, the ones that, the people that the Lord has used him as the vessel to lead them to, to, to salvation. So Onesimus has been converted under Paul's ministry, under Paul's counsel. And he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. So, you see, he's not come to Paul as a converted man. He's not somehow being converted in the household, the church that meets in Philemon's house and on conversion has felt a call to ministry. And it's all, well, the best person to go to about that is Paul. And he's gone over there and, and you know, foolishly done all this. No, he's been converted under Paul's ministry. And what's more, having been converted, we come back to this whole matter of new life, new heart, new beginnings, change. We see change here, look, he says, formerly in verse 11, he was useless to you, but now he has become both useful to me, to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, who is my very heart. 
I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. I'm finding this young man, old man, middle-aged man, whatever he is, I'm finding him very useful. Change, conversion has taken place. And it's interesting as well that Paul kept him. How long has he kept him? Don't know. But he's kept him with him for a period of time. And when I think about that, it takes me right back to when I was converted. And the very first thing I was supposed to be doing was leaving the church I'd just found and moving away from the area and going to a different college to train for a year to become a teacher. I woke up one morning with a profound sense that the Lord was speaking to me and telling me that I needed to stay where I was. That the church where I was in at that point was the place where I was to be for the next year. As it turned out, I was in that area for another year and a half or so. But so strong was the conviction and a reason was on, impressed on my mind as to why I should stay as well. It wasn't just because the people were nice in the church. It was because you're young in faith. If you go to this new place, you're going to be living in close proximity to the people you used to live with. And you're not wise enough. You're not strong enough yet to withstand the temptation and the challenge of so doing so. Stay here with you. And then when the time is right, I will send you back. That was the profound sense of what I believed to be the Lord's will for me. I, to this day, think it was the right decision to not go into teaching at that point. And what I'm using that for is to show you, I think there's something similar here with Paul. Onesimus is converted and Paul keeps him with him because he wants Onesimus to develop. He wants him to grow in his knowledge and his understanding and his love for the Lord. And also, of course, he starts as he goes on to develop in his usefulness. He's growing as a Christian and he needs to be there. But now he's come to a point where he's ready. He's ready to go back. And so Paul is willing to send him. And Paul must send him back. But let's look secondly, how Paul does indeed send him. Paul sends him wanting to receive him back again, but only through Philemon's own willingness. Look at verse 13 again. He says, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me. There's another suggestion that actually um, there's quite a close link between Philemon and Paul, that at some point Philemon was Paul's helper. Maybe it was when Paul was in Ephesus. And so Philemon would know what Paul is talking about here, the kind of help that Onesimus is able to give to Paul, because it's the very same help that he was giving. Perhaps that's what Paul means there. He says he's in chains for the gospel, but then he says in verse 14, I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do will be spontaneous and not forced. He doesn't want to force him into this. So Paul sends him back, wanting to receive him again, but to receive him through Philemon's willingness. But he also sends him back urging, urging Philemon to accept him as a brother, as an equal, as his spiritual equal. And so you read in verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated for you, uh, from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother, as an equal. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. If we consider the verse we love to quote, from Romans 8, 20, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God. Isn't this, in a sense, God's interworking, God's interweaving in events? Let's take the worst case scenario. Philemon 
has lost his slave Onesimus. Onesimus has done something wrong uh, at home and he's feared the consequences. So in the night he's up to left, stolen from his master in order to pay his fare to Rome, fled with no intention of going back and just wanting to maybe squander what money he's got now. But maybe Epaphras has seen him in the street or whatever. Somehow he's gotten to Paul. Now he's been converted. And Paul says, look, all things work together for good for those who love God. It appeared to be bad what was taking place here. But look at the interweaving. Look at how God uses all this. He's led him to me. He's now converted. He's now a changed man. He's now a good man. He's now doing good deeds. He's now useful. Has that all happened, Philemon? Here's the question for you, Philemon. Has that all happened so that he can come back to you and serve you in a much better way and serve the church? All things work together for good, Philemon. Do you not see how the Lord is doing this? Paul sends him back, wanting to receive him back again, urging Philemon to accept him as a brother, but also, and this is powerful, willing, willing to be Onesimus's guarantor. When I was a young lad and I wanted to buy a hi-fi, um, music centre as it was in those days called, I couldn't afford the 79.99. I could pay a deposit and then buy it on HP and pay back some money each month. I think it was six pounds I had to pay a month, but I needed a guarantor. And the only person who could do it was my stepmother, but she didn't want to because she knew already what kind of person I was developing into. I managed to persuade her, she did in the end, uh, and I ultimately didn't let her down on that, but that's another story, but she didn't really want to because she kind of knew the person I was. Another situation, I wanted to borrow some money. This was later on. I wanted to borrow some money for a deposit so I could move into a different place. I went to a family member who I knew had the money and they refused to lend it to me. Even though I promised them I would give them it back within the space of a month. And they had the money, they wouldn't do it. I thought they were mean. But looking back now, it wasn't that they were mean. They knew what I was like. They probably would never have got it back again. You see, Paul, Paul doesn't even set limits. He doesn't say up to X amount, let's use our, our language and our, our money as it were. He doesn't say up to a thousand pounds. He just gives a blank check as it were. A blank check for Philemon to write on it what he will. That is how confident Paul is. Confident about Onesimus that he won't let him down again but also confident that Philemon, Philemon will do above and beyond what he's asked. So he's wants, he sends him back willing to be his guarantor. And in that, there's evidence, evidence that Paul is submissive himself because he's willing to submit. He doesn't feel ultimately that Philemon should charge him anything, but he's willing to submit. If Philemon so wants to, Paul is willing to submit and say, OK, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. And there's a sense in which when he says in verse 19, when he says, uh, well, let's let's just read verses 18 to 19, first of all. Um, verse 17. So if you consider me a part of, partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. And there's a sense in which that last part, you owe me your very self, brings an appeal for Philemon to consider the gospel. Because it's not so much ultimately that he owes his self to Paul, unless he's been dangling over a cliff crying, help, help, and Paul's been the one to come along and rescue him, as it were. It's not really like that. We're talking about him coming to salvation. So ultimately, 
It is an appeal to the gospel. And we were, we're reminded, aren't we, of those who are forgiven much, just like the unjust servant who goes to his master and his master wants to settle accounts and he can't do so. And his master is going to cast him into prison. And he appeals to him. He pleads with him for mercy. And the master has compassion on him and cancels his debts. But the servant then goes out and finds a fellow servant and near half frightens him because he owes him just a few pounds, whereas he owed this other person millions of pounds. And just a few pounds. And a man pleads with him and says, have mercy on me, forgive me, I, I will pay you back. But he won't. He has him thrown into prison. And yet we're reminded of this, that those who are forgiven much, oughtn't we to forgive those who owe us little? And so he appeals to the gospel in this account as well. But Paul also sends him confident. He's confident that Philemon will actually respond in a way that will refresh Paul. He says in verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Above and beyond. So Paul sends him back in this way. Wanting to receive him back again, urging Philemon to accept him as a brother, willing to be a guarantor with a blank check, but also confident. Confident that the response from Philemon will be a wonderful one. A wonderful one. But then thirdly, let's consider what he doesn't do. What he doesn't do. In verse 8, we see that he doesn't use his authority. He says, therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Instead, I appeal on the basis of love. He doesn't order him. He doesn't use his authority. He doesn't force obedience. You see, if he forces obedience, if he says, now, come on, man, do what I'm telling you. I'm an apostle. Do you see this? I mean, what he does is he, he tries to show Philemon what he should do, but he doesn't order him to do it. And he also gives grounds for Philemon to not do what Paul would ultimately like him to do. Perhaps, perhaps he came to me for a little while. The reason you were separated was that you might have him back for good. You see, although Paul wants him back, he's opening up the doorway for Philemon to say, well, this is great. I do cancel all the debt, but I want to keep him here. And Paul's happy with that. So Paul doesn't coerce him into anything. He just, you know, raises all, um, the, raises the ground, as it were, shows the um, parameters, shows, shows a good way. But he doesn't force him to do so would hinder Philemon from submission. Because if Paul at any point says, now I command you as an apostle to do this, that hinders, that hinders the pathway to submission. Because Philemon will do what Paul says. But is that really submission? No, it might be. He might 100% agree, but it doesn't necessarily look like it. And what Paul wants is rather than to have Philemon obey in a strict sense, he wants Philemon and himself to have a reward. He says in verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Benefit, reward. Both of them will receive that. If he forces Philemon to do what he's asking him, what he's suggesting, what he's putting forward, if he forces it, then it will be harder for Philemon to do it willingly. And therefore, there's no reward. Paul might get what he wants in terms of Onesimus back, but what Paul, you see, the parsley heart of Paul, what he wants more than anything is the submissiveness of Philemon, the willingness 
of Philemon from his heart to say, Brother Paul, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. What has happened here? He wants him to, in a sense, be like Esau. There he is galloping with his men towards Jacob. Jacob fears that Esau is going to try and cut off his head or something. And he sends him all these gifts, doesn't he, Jacob, to appease him. Now, whether that does act in that way, in a, in a, uh, whether it is that Esau is appeased through this, whether it's because Jacob's been praying and the Lord's answering the prayer and changing the heart of Esau, you don't get that in the direct text. If you take what literally takes place, when Esau comes there, he throws himself on Jacob because he's, always, he's just overjoyed at seeing his brother again. So he does beyond what Jacob thinks he's going to do. And that's what Paul, in a sense, gives Philemon the opportunity to do and to receive a rich reward, a rich reward of growth as a believer, but also a reward before God for doing that which is good, for doing that which blesses the saints. But also he, what he doesn't do is force obedience because he wants heart submission. He wants Philemon to submit from the heart. Now, as a Christian, there are some things you must do. There are some things it is your duty to obey. When we consider Ephesians 5 and verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. That is not an optional extra. It's not a best not to do that. It's a command. It's written all over the Bible about not getting drunk on strong drink. It's a command. It must be obeyed. But here, here in this particular passage, here there's choice. There's choice. There's a sense in which if Philemon keeps Onesimus, he's done well. If he sends him back to Paul, he's done well. It's Philemon's choice. He Onesimus is legally the property of Philemon. He's a slave. And a case can quite easily be made for Philemon exercising discipline. Fairly, fair discipline. A case can be made for that. If he's forced, he may obey, but his heart is unwilling. There's a sense in which in English a better word is submit. Because if we think of a slave now in the strictest sense, a slave must obey their master. So they do what their master wants them to do. They're obedient, but they're doing it purely out of fear. In their heart, they hate the man. They hate the man. And they're longing for a day when there can be an uprising, as it were. And they can maybe pay back, get their revenge on their master. That's obedience, but not submission it's obedience through fear in their heart there's hatred they despise them whereas someone who submits in the context that we're looking at it here is like in a wrestling match and a person is beaten and one wrestler is on top of them and they've got them down they uh, pinned them to the floor as it were and the one who's being pinned to the floor says i submit i give in I no longer want to wrestle you. You win. That's submission. Stop fighting. You win. Except Christian submission is even greater than that. It has that giving in, as it were, but it's even greater. Because though there are some things that it is a duty for the Christian to do, though there are some things we must obey as a Christian, the Christian has new life. The Christian has new desires. The Christian delights to please Almighty God. The Christian wants to obey. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Make me, mold me, make me into what you want, Lord. Not my will, but your will be done. That's obedience, but it's with a submissive heart, a willingness, a longing for the Lord to take control. And, oh, Lord, I've done it again. I've, I've been the one exerting my authority, but, Lord, I want your authority. I want you in control. That's Christian submission, isn't it? And the outworking of that 
submission to Christ and his authority is that whatever else he requires of me, I will obey. Lord, make me willing to obey. That's the outworking, isn't it? And so fourthly, we see that Philemon submits. We read in verse 21 that Paul is confident of his obedience, confidence of heart submission. Philemon submits. Was it easy to do? Was it hard to do? It's a brotherly thing to do, whether it's easy or hard. It's a brotherly thing to do here. Now, when we consider Barabbas, I've preached on Barabbas. And the question I asked was, Barabbas received his freedom. Remember Barabbas? Who shall I release to you? Jesus or Barabbas? Release Barabbas. What then shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. And Barabbas was released. And the question we ask is, I wonder what Barabbas did with his freedom. I wonder what he did with it. We don't know, do we? There's no evidence to suggest that Barabbas became a disciple because he's never mentioned again anywhere. Unless he changed his name or something, I don't know, but there's no mention of him. But we can be confident that Philemon was submissive, that Philemon did more than Paul asked. How can we be certain of that? Well, because for one, nothing more is said. You don't read anywhere else in scripture of that wretched man Philemon who disobeyed the request or whatever. You don't read anything like that. But more importantly, and I think which clinches it, clinches the matter, is that this was a personal letter to Philemon. If Philemon had not liked what Paul said and had said, I'm not having anything to do with this man Onesimus, I'm not having him back, I don't want anything to do with him, or I'm going to punish him, or, or whatever, or I'm going to charge Paul for taking the household silver, that kind of thing, wouldn't Philemon have suppressed the letter? Wouldn't he have torn it up, torn up the parchment, as it were, and hidden it? He wouldn't have wanted his name to be associated with something that, well, for us is, is good, but actually for him was shame. So I think we can be pretty confident that Philemon did above and beyond what Paul asked. And one final point. There isn't time to go into this, but there is just another side here in terms of submissiveness is Onesimus himself. Onesimus submissiveness. Let's just take the worst case scenario, that he's done something wrong, that he's stolen, that he's fled. Now Paul is wanting to send him back again. Is that the wise thing for Onesimus to do? If he's fled in the first place, does he suspect that his master is not going to be very nice to him? I don't know, but you know, for him to agree to go back shows his own submissiveness. Without the Spirit of God, we don't do these things. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit so that you can submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what Onesimus does. That's what Philemon does. And that's what Paul does, all gathered here. He doesn't run again, Onesimus. He's a new man now. A new man and we can be confident he doesn't run for the same reason that we can be confident that Philemon responds in a good way. If Onesimus had run and not returned, why would this letter be part of the canon of scripture? Now you can argue that, well, because it was penned Paul and he's an apostle, but I believe there are other letters that are penned by Paul that have not survived. The epistle to the Laodiceans, the, I can't say it, Laodos, the, Laodiceans. Doesn't, we don't have that. Yet it was penned by Paul. And there's arguably three epistles to the uh, church at Corinth. We only have two of them. Why don't we have the other? God is in charge of scripture. God didn't want those other ones. 
the canon of scripture is complete with all that God wants it to be complete with. Were this to be that Philemon had run away, then either there would be something else to go with it, or else it wouldn't be here. So Philemon, sorry, Onesimus. So Onesimus, Onesimus too was submissive. So you and I, we may say the right thing. We may do the right thing in small situations. But when I say the right thing, when I do the right thing in small situations, and you think, oh, what a good man, if ever you think such a thing. You don't see the heart, do you? You don't see the heart. What we have here is Paul giving Philemon and Onesimus, Philemon, the opportunity to shine from his heart, to shine with a Christ likeness. Because ultimately, when we submit to one another, we do so out of reverence for Christ or out of the fear of Christ, who himself was willing to be submissive, who himself submitted to his father's will, who himself, as it were, blazed the trail of submissiveness, set up for us the greatest example of submissiveness, though co-equal with God, the father, he submits to his will for the purpose of our redemption and makes himself as nothing, taking on our humanity. He shows the way. Question for you and I is, are we following? Are we following in such, put, put, such footsteps? Put steps? What are put steps? <laughs> such footsteps. The more love we have for the Lord, the more we see his attitude, Christ's attitude of submissiveness to his father, then the more willing you and I will be to do so, to do likewise. Amen. Amen.